My name is Ruth Livesey and I'm a reader in 19th century literature and thought in the English department here at Royal Holloway. And the text I'm going to talk about now is Oscar Wilde's short novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. The Picture of Dorian Gray appeared in two different editions, the first in Lippincott's magazine in 1890, and it got terrible reviews, really hostile attacks on the immorality of its content. And then Wilde produced um, a, a book form edition in 1891. And some of the changes between those editions are quite useful to look at with students I've found over time. And one of the major changes I'm going to start with and, and unpack in a few directions um, to structure what I want to say today is the preface um, that Wilde um, added to the book edition of the novel. And the preface is a, a thing, famously, of many, many paradoxes. Uh, perhaps the most famous of which is um, the statement, there is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well written or badly written. That is all. And the reason I want to start with that um, statement is that it raises a whole range of avenues into discussing this text in detail, I think. Because in some ways, Dorian Gray as a book has all the trappings of an old fashioned morality tale. This, if we think about it, is a story that retells a Faustian morality tale, a Faustian pact. Dorian offers up his soul in order to hold on to perpetual beauty. Now, interestingly, that insertion of the language of Dorian trading his soul and the word soul reappears many more times in the second book edition. And, and again, that's perhaps something you could trace out by comparing the two volumes online, searching, searching the two versions um, using Google Books um, or, or, or something along those lines. Um, so the emphasis is there that this book both offers itself up in so many ways to be read as a morality tale and yet that preface tells us there is no such thing as a moral or immoral book and on top of that it tells us that no artist has ethical sympathies and ethical sympathy in an artist is an unpardonable mannerism of style. The moral life of man forms part of the subject matter of the artist but the morality of art consists in the perfect use of an imperfect medium. These are really tricky paradoxes to unpick and it can be quite an off-putting start to the novel. So I always try and get students to look at the preface after they've read the novel and after we've had a really good discussion about how the novel relates to the Gothic genre and particularly that late Victorian Gothic interest in narratives of split or double selves. And um, I would just suggest that you might want to look at a, a very useful piece by John Bowen on Gothic literature, um, so again on the British Library website, and it is freely available. And that really helps a wider understanding of how um, Wilde's text works in, a, in, a, in a, a growing interest in this period of narratives of split and double selves, of haunted present day existence in London in particular. And it's very useful to place Dorian Gray alongside works like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or Bram Stoker's Dracula, texts which are all playing with ideas of a, a corruption at the heart of the city and the idea of a, a split or divided self. So Dorian Gray plays, I'm suggesting, with what with a morality tale. He's a, a man who pursues his desires and meets his end at his own hand. It's an act of suicide, that last scene. He stabs the portrait a plot spoiler but Dorian stabs the portrait but he himself is the one found dead on the floor with the knife in his heart but finally wearing the face of the portrait and that stabbing of the self brings body and soul surface and depth art and life back together at the end and that's a very important conclusion of this book because if we were to read it as a straightforward morality tale, that act of death at the end would confirm that the whole novel is in practice perhaps one long suicide note. That Dorian's attempt to, to live a life in which his exterior, his surface, 
is separate from his deep interior morality, his truth, his soul, is unsustainable. And at the end is ugliness and death. So that it's impossible for human beings to live as split selves. But that's a very difficult interpretation in many ways to sustain with the fact that so much of the argument of the book about the value of pursuing a life of pleasure, of living your life as if you were a beautiful work of art, of, of beauty being the only one important um, category of judgment, all these arguments come from the mouth of Lord Henry. And Lord Henry Wootton, in so many of those speeches, is just churning out words that Wilde himself prints under his own name in several of his critical essays. So Wilde is a, is a well-known plagiarist and self-plagiarist and, and loves borrowing things from himself as well as other people. Uh, and in Dorian Gray, many of those speeches addressed to Dorian, in which we might see Lord Henry luring the once virtuous Dorian away from the path of virtue into, into a pursuit of curious pleasures and sins, those are words that Wilde was happy to publish under his own name. So to then read it as a morality tale in which that is a, a wrong decision on Dorian's part is very suspect. But there's where we get a very um, interesting crux in this novel, I think, because the novel tells us one more thing um, about how to read it. All art is at once surface and symbol. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. Those who read the symbol do so at their peril. So there in the preface, we're given that sense that we tend to read either in terms of a surface or a depth, a surface or a symbol in Wilde's language, um, the, the, a beautiful outside and a moral inside, splitting how we approach a text. And of course, the whole story of Dorian Gray is about our desire to see things as if they're split up, but the truth that it holds on to, that we are one thing and that wholeness is what needs to be strived towards. Because in some ways we could see the morality of this story being that, that Dorian, it's not that Dorian follows Lord Henry's advice. It's not that he tries to live as if he's a work of art. It's more that he splits himself in half and half of him is a, 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 a unaging work of art and the other half of him is all this corrupt self so he doesn't achieve that wholeness that unity of being that is at the heart of Lord Henry Wootton's advice to, to Dorian to, to be somehow beyond life and live as if he's a work of art so that's one way of thinking about some of those conundrums that the opening of the novel presents to us um, of course, one very famous context for reading this novel too, and one that I'd really advise um, all teachers to consider, is how the novel itself was used in Wilde's trials, um, just a few years after its publication. Um, so when Wilde is on trial um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the case with Queensbury, first for libel and then for gross indecency, um, the novel itself, and particularly the preface, is quoted extensively by the barrister for the prosecution. And there's a very good site um, at the, uh, the, easily located by Google at the University of Missouri, um, where there are some very useful excerpts from the witness statements for the trial that could be printed out and given to students to look at or to read. And there they interviewed young men who um, claimed to have been solicited by Wilde, the staff in the hotel, Wilde himself, and Wilde's own speeches um, from uh, the witness box are um, extraordinary documents in terms of him performing a certain identity that, again, tried to be free from the sort of straightforward moral accountability that the barrister, that the law was trying to impose on his actions. Um, now, reading those trial transcripts and Wilde's speeches are a wonderful way in for students to, if you like, inhabit Wilde, who's one of the most performative writers one can think of. Um, and I've often had students do that to great effect, where they, they think about his diction and his mode of delivery as, as, as well as the content and what, what position he's taking up in the court. And that's well worth doing. Um, and is, of course, deeply moving, um, given the, the, 
the, the eventual outcome of that case and its impact not just on his life but on the lives of so, of so many um, so many people in decades to come who lived in fear um, because of the, the case of Wilde and its national notoriety, international notoriety. Um, but I'd also be slightly cautious about um, pursuing readings of Dorian Gray solely as a text that is a, that has a coded homosexual subtext. I think there are ways of doing that. I think this is undoubtedly what we might call a queer text. There are very strange displacements going on throughout the novel. But at the same time, I, I don't think it's a coded secret message about a homosexual subculture in the way some critics have viewed it. Um, having said that, I think there's a, such a deliberate ambiguity about the sorts of sins we're told that Dorian has engaged in that it does open up that, that rich sense of, well, what are these sins? What kind of depravities are these hinting at? Why do young men who've been friended, befriended by Dorian end up killing themselves? So that it opens the door to that whole world of blackmail and conspiracy that surrounded homosexual subcultures in late Victorian London, undoubtedly. But I, but I think it's a mistake to read the text too closely in, in biographical ways. But to read Wilde as a performer as a ventriloquizer who enjoyed playing with voice and being deliberately evasive about having meaning pinned to his work um, is, is one um, important avenue for exploring this text. One final point that I might make about this work is to put it in a slightly different context, which is of Wilde as the ultimate spokesperson for the aesthetic movement in literature and the arts in Britain in the 1880s. He's certainly the best remembered now and he's clearly the figure who satirists, cartoonists, playwrights lampoon and put on stage with a, with a variety of, of lightly disguised names throughout the 1880s. He was famous before he was famous for, uh, you know, even as an undergraduate he became a punch cartoon um, about, you know, drooping over the beauty of his blue china. So he marketed his personality almost before he marketed his literary output. Um, but in that context, the fact that Dorian Gray as a novel refuses to let us separate out surface and symbol, depth and, and surface, art and life, most importantly, is how it ties in to the programmes of the aesthetic movement art for art's sake, not for life's sake. Now that doesn't mean that art has no ethical content. What that means is that art needs to be judged by its own rules. In that sense, art can only be good or bad art. It can't be misleading or a poor moral example. You can have any subject material the focus of an artwork as long as it is well written. And that, in a sense, is Wilde's strongest case about Dorian Gray, that it was judged to be an immoral book because it dealt with corruption and the pursuit of pleasure. But for Wilde and for many of his followers, pursuing pleasure and the limits to which this was the correct approach to life is a really important ethical question too. One of Wilde's most inspirational um, influences was the critic Walter Pater and he said the question when you're viewing a work of art shouldn't be you know is this the best thing that's been thought and known in the world it shouldn't be an objective assessment of its qualities it should be does it give me pleasure and that's a really radical act because it's licensing everybody to decide on their own instinctive references as to whether a work of art is of value to them. So it places art at the centre of everybody's lives, not just that particularly of an elite.